and here I am. And actually, while I haven't been speaking to many people during the last two days, um, it basically came to my mind that uh, not many people know about service provider networks. So many people know about campus networks or data center networks, but service provider networks is largely unknown. And for example, we had a discussion last night, and then some guys just says, oh, you use MPLS, so isn't like MPLS uh, uh, deprecated, or, or does anyone really use MPLS? So I mean, it's that unknown most of the times. But yeah, I come from Estonian Telecom, so we are the largest operator in there, and then we also do fixed access, and we also do mobile. And I'm kind of like network architect type of guy, but I also, well, I want to be hands-on. So I do the configuration stuff, deployment, and that's basically my like pet project, is getting IPv6 deployed. And um, this is actually the situation of Estonian IPv6 uh, eight months ago. Uh, no, this slide is not broken. This is, uh, um, this is totally white, because there basically was no IPv6 deployment in Estonia whatsoever eight months ago. And suddenly this happened. Uh, and um, you can observe that uh, we managed to reach 6% uh, uh, deployment in the country. So it's not in our network, but it's totally in the country. Uh, and this happened about in about four weeks. Uh, so not many people could understand that how is that possible. So how did we deploy IPv6 for our customers in four weeks and how did we do it? And we'll, I will have some details on it. And then I'm also going to describe, well, basically, that's a mix of like showcase, so how did we do it, and a mix of how did we secure it, and, and basically to give you an ideas that maybe you can do it in your networks. And I will, well, this talk will be largely around the BNG. So we will go into the BNG part and what the BNG actually does, because the BNG itself is also largely unknown for, for many people. But uh, this is what we did. 6% uh, is not that bad. Uh, when you look at the map of the Europe, uh, uh, then we basically joined this elite club of countries which, are, which have IPv6 deployed and then have reached 5% or even more. So that's Estonia up there. And we're not uh, at like Norway's level or, or, or let's say France also. France is uh, red on this picture. For some reason, the red indicates that there are some delays uh, introduced by IPv6, but uh, well, there are other big countries as well. Um, so that's something that's measured by Google. But this basically gives an overview that not many countries in the Europe actually have reasonable IPv6 deployments. And so, but this is happening now. So, and actually what we did is we have been working on this for more than three years. Uh, but actively working. Of course, we have been planning IPv6 and thinking about IPv6 even more, but, uh, but we actually did this during the last three years. And, but unfortunately, uh, there is no way to make a business case around IPv6 deployment. So I tried. I tried to make a business case, show that there is some money involved, but all I could come up with are costs, and costs everywhere, but no money involved. So uh, we basically had trade-off that we had to make. So either get IPv6 deployed in, like use IPv6 RD, which is rapid deployment, or any kind of tunneling environment, or just wait for a while. And we chose the second one, so because we had the BNG platform replacement coming up, and more about the BNG later, uh, coming up anyway. So we thought that, okay, we will into, uh, basically mix this IPv6 thing into the BNG replacement project, and still do it properly. So we waited a bit, and then did it properly. So we didn't want to do the IPv6 twice, so we didn't want to do tunneling, and then a proper solution. So we wanted to do native IPv6 from the day zero. So there wouldn't be any additional costs involved because engineering, operations, everything costs. And also in like service point networks, that's not typically not the case like in data center or, or even some campus networks. Of course, yeah, there are large campus networks in the world, but uh, there are only so few. Uh, the service provider network footprint is huge. So it's covering like the whole country. We have tens of thousands of access devices. And even if we would basically decide that, yes, we will replace everything, uh, pay any vendor good money for it and for the equipment, there still isn't, uh, well, it takes a lot of man hours to replace all this equipment. Uh, because we cannot do it, we have to like plan maintenance, uh, organize it together with some customers, and so on and so on. So this is the actual problem. So uh, replacing your access network takes time, and it takes a lot of time. So I would say that 
if we would want to replace all of our access network, it would probably take five to six years. So when we have uh, like seven, eight types of access equipment on multiple technologies right now and several generations, some of them are newer, some of them are older, and basically everything is gradually getting replaced, but it will take some time. But then again, when we deployed IPv6, we didn't want to we didn't want to do, have any trade-offs in security. So we wanted to do it like properly, native IPv6, secure, so it would work, and we will not be on slides somewhere showing that, that these are the unsecure IPv6 operators in the world, and so on. They are doing spoofing or whatsoever. So security is important for us. Uh, also, we got uh, into the next generation CP, so the actual Ethernet or DSL termination device at the customer home, the customer premises equipment, as it's called. Uh, we used to use a VX workspace device back then. Now we are using Linux based device with actually modified OpenVRT inside. This means that we can also run our own code in there. We can modify the code base if we want to, and we actually do run some of our own code in there. Uh, also, uh, because the IPv6 is, well, uh, because we can control our network, we can control everything until the CP, but then there is a customer LAN, and we cannot connect, uh, we cannot control the customer home network. Uh, so that's why it's very important for us that we, would, we will not break anything for the customer. And then happy eyeballs, uh, let's say movement or the happy eyeballs protocol itself, uh, which is a method to do IPv6 and IPv4 connections to the, let's say, web server. And if the IPv6 connection doesn't succeed, it will fall back to the IPv4, it will catch this information, it will not retry IPv6 anymore, and so on. So this was really important for us. So even if we break IPv6 in some of the configurations for the customers, the idea was that the customer should not notice it. And we also got rid of the PPPoE in our network. So at least on our modern network, we do, as a fact, have some ATM-based network uh, left. Uh, so that doesn't have an IPv6, obviously. Uh, and now I try to describe a little bit how our network looks like, and I will go into more detail on the next slides, but um, let's try to understand it quickly, and then we can basically pick up this information later on. But the physical topology up here, that's the physical topology. So we ha this kind of access network is Ethernet, many VLANs around, and this is strictly three topology. So there is no redundancy involved, so it's strictly three. So, and then we get into the MPLS network. We have MPLS Metro Network and the MPLS Core Network. They can be rings, they can be mesh, mesh networks, so the physical topology itself is not important because when we look at actual service, so we, we, didn't, we don't use like VLAN per customer, we use service VLANs. So all the uh, internet customers at the access node are put into the same VLAN and we use this kind of split horizon uh, VLANs. Uh, Cisco calls them private VLANs, uh, other vendors call them different things. But the idea here is that, yes, you have shared VLAN, but the customers cannot send packets directly to each other. So there is only like one uplink port where you can send packets to. And basically we connect all these three network into our uh, MPLS edge, where we have well, basically may have generated the VPLS. So all these service VLANs are merged together into single VPLS, which is still split horizon between all these physical access ports. And then we use MPLS pseudo wires, uh, which run over our MPLS Metro and Core network to get this uh, Ethernet, let's say, get, to get this service VLAN from this region into our BNG boxes. And this is done using MPLS pseudo wires. And we use a uh, dual box uh, system, so basically we have two BNGs that are geographically different places. So even if we have failure in one geographical place, we still have another BNG device somewhere else. And all that IP routing actually happens at the BNG. And there are many, many things that happen here. So basically the, the, the default gateway for the customer CPE that sits there is the BNG device. So there is no routing. This is just strictly L2 domain. Uh, there's no routing involved. Uh, we keep subscriber state here. We do radius authentication. Uh, we do DHCP version 4 and version 6 servers in here. We do RPF checks, so no spoofing. And this is actually strictly not RPF, but even more detailed. Uh, we do a proxy R for IPv4, and we do quality of service. So it's all happening in the BNG. So, does anyone at this point have any questions about that? Oh, do at least understand this concept, so how, how it's done? So, because otherwise the following topics are quite pointless. But that's how we do it. And the trick here is that uh, we have small Ethernet uh, domain, that's tree without redundancy, 
And then we get to the MPLS network, where we basically get the layer two redundancy for free because everything is carried using MPLS pseudo wires or Ethernet over MPLS. And basically, these are the enablers for us. So, as I said, you get the free layer two redundancy uh, with Ethernet over MPLS, so you don't have to worry about uh, the actual topology in the metro network because for your Ethernet VLAN or a service VLAN, it's just point to point, uh, point to point pseudo wire while it can be taken over like mesh networks or reroute that to other links if necessary and so on. So that's very important for us. And actually we constantly try to push the MPLS closer to the customer. So ideally we would like to start the MPLS pseudo wire directly from the access node and not have any Ethernet network whatsoever. Um, not that realistic today, uh, probably in five years. Then, of course, in the core network, we use uh, 6PE to ca uh, carry our IPv6 traffic over our MPLS core. That's totally boring part, uh, and it's quite horrible hack. And luckily, the LDP version 6 and segment routing are getting deployed, or vendors are actually now shipping code. At least two major vendors are now shipping code for, for segment routing, and at least one vendor is shipping code for the LDP version 6. Uh, now then, the BNG part, which is super important for us, uh, other vendors call it uh, subscriber management, uh, where there are many, many different names for that. But the idea there is that you have a DHCP or ARP request that actually initiates the subscriber creation, and then you do the authentication and stuff around that, and you have some kind of state that this MAC address on this port is a subscriber, it has a name, it has a quality of service profile, it ha might have an access list, and so on. So you can do many of these on top of single physical interface, or let's say single IP interface. Uh, and we have a centralized subscriber state, so that's important for us. Uh, this, it is not distributed to the edges, so the edge port configuration at the access uh, network is actually quite simple. There is no customer specific uh, rate limiting or whatsoever there. There is just some security features and, th and then the port is enabled and that's about it. So the thing that configures the port when the new customer is turned up is, is quite stupid. And everything ha else happens at the BNG. Uh, for the SDN part, so I get to mention SDN because SDN uh, means totally everything in networking nowadays. Uh, so when you, you can actually uh, implement your own radio server and put your own code in there and do whatever you want in the radio server, you can call it SDN and it will be totally fine. But here yeah, we have implemented our own radio server, more about it later on. Uh, then with PNG you immediately get uh, due to the radius authentication, because every subscriber creation, deletion, is uh, basically there is first radius authentication, and then there is accounting as well. So you get uh, the IP and IPv6 prefix and the address usage into your radius database. So you don't have to do it from DHCP servers. And very importantly for us is that uh, we can implement this IPv6 unique cost router advertisement hack. Uh, which, be, which uh, actually becomes really important uh, later, later down this presentation. Again, the split horizon or the private VLAN is super important for us. Um, it's a controversial topic. Many people say that it's not easy to manage. And I agree that Cisco with private VLANs makes it quite hard to manage. And it's quite horrible. Other vendors make it uh, somewhat easier. There are vendors where you basically can, on switch can say that uh, this is a MOX type VLAN, just one line of configuration, and this means that any of the ports on that VLAN can send traffic to each other, and then you have to designate the specific uplink port and say that this is the actual uplink port and you can send traffic there. So if you uh, screw up the configuration, then uh, basically nothing will work. So you will know immediately, uh, other than uh, screwing up the configuration on Cisco and hoping it will work, but actually the split horizon is not working and packets are sent between the customers. So it depends on, on uh, basically vendor to vendor basis, but I would say it is doable. Of course, you need uh, uh, your normal tools, you have to make sure that your devices are configured correctly, pick up the configuration. Well, you have to have it everything and you must make sure that your configuration is deployed correctly. This is the main key with service VLANs. If you have VLAN per customer, it makes it uh, that much easier. But VLAN per customer in many situations is not just scalable enough. Uh, now, even if you have BNG that does all the fancy layer 3 stuff, does all the rate limiting, uh, does all the spoofing checks and so on, you still have to protect this layer 2 domain. And there are basically two things that can affect you. And uh, this will happen. 
because the customers somehow will figure out how to make the loop at the home network. So if you are providing DSL-based access, it's somewhat harder to do because you need a DSL CP and that they probably, customers probably take the DSL CP from us, use that, and there will not be any loops involved. Uh, but we also uh, offer Ethernet-based access, which means the customers can connect switches, routers, whatever they want to the Ethernet port we give them, and they will make loops there. So you basically want to make sure that if there is any loop at the customer, but basically down, downstream from the customer port, you first want to catch that loop somehow, uh, for example, with spanning tree, uh, or there are proprietary loop detection methods available. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you don't learn too many MAC addresses from this access node port. So we limit our access nodes uh, for eight MAC addresses per customer, for example. If there are more than eight MAC addresses per customer, we just shut down the port. So there must be something wrong. Because we limit customer for uh, four active uh, IP, IP sessions. So there, in any reasonable way, there couldn't be more than four MAC addresses. We allow some extra if the customer switches device or something like that. But if there are more than eight, there must be something wrong, and we shut down the port. And uh, another trick there is that even if you have loop detection, the loop detection might, be, might not be fast enough. So uh, the frames that, uh, Ethernet frames that are coming from the PNG towards the customer get looped back and sent to the network again. And this will make your Ethernet access learn the BNG MAC address from the customer port. And of course, that would break all the connectivity for all the customers in that segment, because the BNG Mac will suddenly point downstream towards the customers. So you must, and then again, yes, the loop protection will take care of that, but loop protection is not fast enough. So there might be one, two frames that can leak before the loop protection kicks in. So you have to make sure that the BNG Mac addresses uh, cannot be learned from the access node ports. There are, depending on vendor, there are methods to do that. It would help if you can actually hard code MAC addresses to your BNG. So you select a MAC address and stick with it or use just virtual MAC addresses only. Like with SRP, VRP or stuff like that. But there still might need, be need for the physical MAC addresses and both of these BNGs if you have redundancy to send packets. If you don't have redundancy and you have just only one BNG device, it becomes that much easier. And of course, you want to limit the, the unknown unicast, uh, multicast and broadcast frames. Uh, actually, we did drop uh, multicast uh, in our previous access node configuration because in IPv4 only world, we didn't have any use case for the multicast uh, Ethernet frames whatsoever. So we just dropped them. Now we had to modify our configuration in the access network to allow multicast at some reasonable rates. But you have to at least limit them to some reasonable rates. Otherwise, you can, again, if there is a loop, there are some packets that are being sent and you, well, might. Network might get hit. Now, uh, with IPv4, because in this kind of situation, you have a big subnet that's allocated to this layer two or multiple layer two domains. And the customer IP addresses are just in that segment. And the customer CPs, uh, if, for example, if, if customer A wants to send packet to customer B and they are in the same IP subnet, obviously what would happen is that the CP will do an ARP request because it's directly connected subnet. Uh, obviously, the ARP request will never reach other customer because the packets will only be sent towards the BNG. And then you, with business customers, for example, you very quickly will get problems because uh, business customers get like static IP addresses. They will some do, do some port forwardings. And if your uh, domains are quite large, you might have problems that, uh, well, also one of our customer case was exactly that. So it was that customer had a like office connection and a home connection. And they both terminated at the same BNG device. And the customer wanted from home to connect to his VPN that was port forwarded at his business connection at the office towards his LAN, some LAN device. But he couldn't do that because we didn't add that time. So that was like when we deployed the BNG for IPv4, like five, six years ago. We didn't have proxy ARP at that time. So that connectivity didn't work. And obviously, there were customer complaints. So that would, help, that would happen to you so if you do it. So you need to have proxy ARP. So if the customer ARPs for a second IP address at the same layer two domain, the ARP request will reach BNG and BNG will check, okay, this is an ARP request for someone that's, well, at the same interface. Uh, we should do something about it. It will check if I have a subscriber for it. See, okay, we have subscriber information for that. The subscriber is active and so on. Pick out the MAC address and pick out the IP address and basically fake an ARP response saying that 
yes, this IP is directly connected, please send traffic to this MAC address. But the MAC address would actually be the BNG MAC address. So the customer to customer traffic gets sent to the BNG and then back to the real customer again. But the proxy ARP will just make it uh, possible. Otherwise, the CP will just ARP for that destination and there will not, not be any ARP responses. Uh, with IPv6, because the IPv6 is uh, the prefix for the customer is always routed towards CP. So this IPv4 thing, if you have like routed prefixes and the CP is a router, there is no NAT involved, which is very unrealistic today, uh, then you wouldn't also have that problem. But because there is NAT involved and you want to connect to the uplink interface, you will have this IPv4 problem. With IPv6, uh, because everyone are talking to the devices that are behind the customer router, so this uh, connectivity get, will get routed to, through the BNG anyway, because the customer only has default route. Default route points to the BNG, the traffic is sent to the BNG and then back to our subscriber. So that's how it works in the V6 world. So you don't technically need any hacks. You will uh, need this exact same proxy ARP technology for IPv6 should you want to deploy IPv6 NAT, for example. I don't know why, but if you would want to do that, then you would need it. Uh, then how the boot up actually looks like in this network. So that again maybe tries to explain so you can fully understand what's happening. Uh, first of all, the CP boots up. It sends out the DHCP version 4 discovery. Uh, and this discovery reaches the access device. Uh, access device uh, inserts DHCP option 82 uh, to the DHCP request, and then this DHCP request gets sent to the BNG. And option 82, well, there are actually two sub options there. There is a circuit ID and then there's a remote ID. And the access node inserts information about itself. So this basically inserts uh, any kind of identifier about the access node. So the BNG can know that this request came from this access node. And then also inserts information about the access node port. So the BNG can know that this request came from that access node, let's say port uh, 85, for example. And then this is actually the information we use to authenticate the customer. So in the Radius database, we have basically have an entry that, that this access device and this port number means this customer. If this record is not found, the customer is not authenticated, and we will not allow any internet access. So that's how it's done. And then there is basically a normal DHCP uh, v4 exchange to the DHCP server. Uh, we use DHCP servers that are hosted directly at the BNG. You don't have to. You can use external DHCP server. Uh, and then when the radius authentication succeeds, we create this subscriber and the v4 part is working. Then the CP obviously will ARP for the default gateway, BNG will re respond, and IPv4 will flow. Now for IPv6 part, it becomes a little bit interesting because uh, naturally you would want to do exactly the same thing for IPv6, but unfortunately you couldn't, uh, due to the creative things that have been created for IPv6. So you have to resort to some hacks. Uh, so and the problem with IPv6 is that uh, you cannot carry a default route information in DHCPv6. Uh, well, let's say this is, uh, well, being constantly discussed at IETF, but uh, today you cannot do that. So you have to have router advertisements there for uh, inserting a default route information to the CP. So how we, ha we have done it is that when the V4 subscriber is created, the BNG starts sending normal unsolicited uh, route advertisements to the CP, but it doesn't send them to the multicast MAC address like it should. I mean, normally the router sends the route advertisement to the multicast MAC address every once in a while, and you can have the solicited request from the CP. But here, uh, the actual router advertisements are sent per, uh, per subscriber. So when the V4 subscriber is created, the BNG starts generating router advertisement for that specific MAC address and starts sending them out. And this is only there to inject the default route. route. So there are no uh, on-link prefix information in that router advertisement, so the uh, CP cannot pick up any IP configuration from there. There is only managed bit set that's necessary for some of the CPs to initiate the HPV V6. Uh, and basically, that's about it. Uh, as a uh, next hop uh, MAC address, we use the virtual MAC address, and we use virtual uh, link local address for V6. So because we have BNG redundancy, if we ch shift traffic from one BNG to another BNG, we want to make sure that uh, the link local address for the default route would not change. So we use a virtual link local address there that's being hard-coded into the BNG configuration. And uh, 
obviously the CP doesn't know anything about this hack. So CP still sends his neighbor discovery request to the multicast address, but because the multicast cannot reach anything else than a BNG, because everything else is split horizon, so none of the other customers at the segment can receive it. So these neighbor discovery requests are sent to the BNG only. And BNG mostly discards everything. If you uh, would want to do uh, basically spoof the router advertisements there, spoof THCP version 6 server, the BNG would not care because all these packets will get dropped. And none of the other customers will be impacted because it's all split horizon. So unfortunately, this is required. And you might ask that, OK, but what's wrong with sending out the router advertisement for the whole segment? But we do not want the, the CPEs that are not authorized to pick up the IPv6 default route because they might fail DHCP version 6 uh, authentication in the next step. So we want the only authorized CPEs to pick up the default route information. So basically, when the CPE is, is starting, then we will send out the router advertisement, and then this way the default route will be installed. So it is horrible in some way, but then again, this is not something that's been invented by us. Uh, vendors have implemented it, and vendors have basically implemented it because there is a customer demand. So in the like, service provider networks, you cannot just configure an IPv6 default router and just inject this default route to all of the CPs. We want to have some control over it. So it would be super ideal if that would not be needed, and you can basically force the CP to start DHCPv6 immediately, and then you could inject the default route with DHCPv6. But no, today you cannot do that. And as a next step, uh, there is a normal DHCPv6 exchange taking, taking part. Uh, it's, in our case, it's delayed. So we have put some code into the CP. So the CP will wait until the CP has DHCPv4 lease. It, it will not start DHCPv6 before. Other CPs will wait for this router development managed bit. So if the managed bit is not set, they will not start DHCPv6 at all. So it might depend from CP to CP. And what we do is uh, we obviously use prefix delegation only. So there is no network address. So the actual CP uplink interface only has link local address. So there is no globally addressable IPv6 address there. There is only just one single prefix delegation prefix per CP. And that's how we do, it, do this. And then how the neighbor discover information is learned by the BNG. It's basically BNG checks that where this, this DHCPv6 request came from and then check the MAC address and basically that way the neighbor discover information is learned. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have the lightweight DHCP relay support in our access nodes. So lightweight DHCP relay is basically the option 82 equivalent in the IPv6 world. Uh, not all of our access nodes support it. We have some that do, but because, we, because not all of them support it, we have now chosen not to use it at this point. So we are basically waiting until all of our access nodes can support it. Uh, and this means that we have to do some kind of workaround hack to actually authenticate all of our V6 sessions. But because we are working on this kind of, we know the Ethernet segment, and in the radius request, we know that this uh, request came from this specific Ethernet segment. We know which PNG it is, we know which MAC address it was. So what we do is we check if we have uh, a record based on the v4 session. So we have information that there is a v4 session that's authenticated in this Ethernet segment with this MAC address. So it can only be that same customer. Because obviously, you cannot have two MAC addresses at the same Ethernet segment that are two different customers. You will have MAC address conflicts, and it will not, the v4 would not work anyway. So this basically is a key, for, uh, key thing for us. So we do this in a radius. And this way, we can match the v6, v6 uh, six session to the v4 session and basically authenticate the v6 using v4 data. And if we don't find a v4 session, uh, we just reject the radius authentication. Uh, it is a possible denial of service vector, because if I will not start a v4 session and just start injecting uh, DHCP v6 solicit messages into the wire, uh, there will be a radius, re uh, radius request sent out via the VNG, radius response, and it basically will overload the VNG and radius at some point. But again, the vendors have done quite a good job on that. So they are heavily rate limiting these things. They are caching. So for example, on our platforms, uh, the rate, uh, if the radius request is sent out, uh, they basically cache the radius request and they cache the response. And if, this, if there is a similar request, or not similar, exactly the same request, 
that these need to be sent out after that, they will just pull the information from the cache. So they will not send, basically, they will send out only one radius request per 10 seconds for the same data. They are heavily rate limiting it. So that's how they, how they do that, and that's why this is not the problem for us. So we thought that it will be a problem, but then w during the testing, we just found out that it actually, well, someone has actually thought about it, and it is fixed. And uh, this means that because we, are, we have one set of PNGs for V6 and V4, and we share this kind of subscriber, then we can also share the sh actual shapers. So from customer point of view, it doesn't matter if he does his YouTube video watching over V4 or V6, the customer still gets limited to whatever package uh, he has bought. And there is also a quality of service aspect in there, so we prioritize voice over IP data uh, over the internet data, for example. And so again, if I will do heavy IPv6 Facebook, my voice over IP will not be affected. And obviously we need to provide a IPv6 DNS information somehow as well. Uh, you don't strictly have to have IPv6 DNS, but we thought that, okay, while we are at it, uh, why not? So the V6 DNS information is sent via the DHCP V6. So the CP actually has a V4, set of V4 DNS servers and set of V6 DNS servers. Any questions so far? Let's go on. Uh, so what does it look like from the CPU perspective? Is that we have slash 50, 56 per customer. So this is allocated using the prefix delegation. Uh, to make, um, because in the V6 world you have a problem where this prefix and the subset of these prefixes uh, are basically delegated to your local area network, the customer home. The devices pick up the addresses, the devices pick up the default route. Uh, you don't want to change that prefix when there is, let's say, a short interruption of the internet <coughs> connectivity. So, yes, there are CPs that can handle it correctly. So, uh, the same way they can handle the router advertisement timer synchronization, for example. But then there are CPs that couldn't do that. So we chose to actually cache the lease information for up to 24 hours. So whatever customer does, if there is a short interruption of the internet connectivity, if the lease times out, the actual uh, DHCP v6 server uh, keeps a record that this customer had this uh, prefix. So the customers technically have stat static uh, v6 prefixes. Uh, the prefix can only change after 24 hours. So that's our, basically, we don't want to change the customer uh, LAN prefix if not required at all. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. We don't find any problems with that. So we don't give you any promises. So we will actually have static uh, V6 prefix available, but we will not give you any pre promises, but to make it easier for everyone and to make it actually work in all the different scenarios, this is actually a good thing to have. And it's not like you are short of addresses in the V6 anyway, so not really a problem. And the timer synchronization is also quite interesting because for example, you have a router advertisement that says that, uh, well, your default route is good for half an hour. Uh, you don't want to inject the router advertisement into the local area network saying that the default route towards the CP, well, inside from the CP, is good for one hour. So uh, correct CPs do it in a way that they actually propagate the router advertisement timers from the uplink interface towards the LAN interface. So the second the uplink interface uh, router advertisement timer runs out and the uh, default route is removed. The second, actually, the, all the devices at the customer home also remove their IPv6 default route. And they actually do the same for the DSCPv6 lifetimes. So again, this is strictly not necessarily needed, but it will, make, it will actually make everyone's life easier if, if, it, if it works correctly. And there is actually a TR126 or something like that uh, around in the internet uh, from the broadband forum that uh, actually describes how the CP should behave. And this is in the TR1, I think it was TR126. So that's in there as well. So there is basically a long list of requirements for IPv6 CP. So even if you want to do that at some point and take a look, there are broadband forum documents available and they are actually quite good. Yeah. 
yeah, 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 I will get it. So, yeah, so, and how do we divide this slash 56 up is that uh, nowadays we have only good use for the three of the slash, slash 64s out of the 255. Uh, we basically pick uh, first of them, uh, first of the slash 64s for the loopback interface because we don't have any IPv6 prefix on the uplink interface. We want to have sta stable prefix that we can use for the CP management. Uh, so we picked uh, one for the loopback. The second one for the customer local area network, so the same, same interface where normally your private IPv4 addresses and that's get netted towards the internet. And in there, we actually do typical normal IPv6 uh, router advertisement that has an on-link on -link prefix information available. that says that please do out the configuration with that prefix. Uh, we also inject, inject uh, DNS information into the router advertisement and uh, we also inject the uh, OBIT which is the other configuration available bit in the router advertisement uh, should the actual end user device know how to do stateless DHCP version 6. It can only do, also do stateless DHCP version 6 and get the DNS information that way. So it's basically two ways to get DNS information. And the third one we use the, for the public Wi-Fi which is the which is thing that the customer can enable. O obviously, there is an IPv4 there as well, but there is a firewall in place so that no customer traffic can go between the local area network and the Wi-Fi. But for the uh, IPv4 part, there is just second uh, private IP range there. For IPv6, we don't see any reason why there shouldn't be a second slash 64 there. So that's something that's not uh, uh, enabled by default, but if the customer wants a public Wi-Fi, so we can go to the custom CP web, web interface and just click the enable public Wi-Fi and change the SSID and whatsoever. And you get basically dual stack public Wi-Fi as well. Uh, regarding the configuration, so that was something that obviously was brought up by our like, help desk and all people in the company when they heard about the IPv6. So, oh, we are doing IPv6 public IP address everywhere. Oh my God, the sky will fall. So that's why we, will, we actually implemented the ingress firewall there because the V4 is protected by the NAT firewall. <laughs> uh, so we need something for V6. So actually we have a ingress V6 firewall that uh, by default drops all inbound TCP, for example. Uh, but this is totally something the customer can go into the CP uh, web interface and configure. So we don't, uh, basically we say that you are protected. If you want to make any holes that firewall, please go ahead. And also regarding the code that we run in the CP, uh, we actually implemented the neighbor discovery logging because um, we have, well, our internal, let's say, help desk tools are, well, I would say, excellent uh, compared to other operators. Uh, and we, there we have feature that you can see the actual real-time V4 uh, ARP entries. You can see which CP uh, switch ports they are ac uh, actually connected to, what's the Mac vendor, and so on and so on, to make uh, help desk's life easier. For example, if the customer calls in and says that I have a problem with my setup box, the help desk guy can immediately check that which CP port actually set the box is connected to and so on. With V6, it was a little bit problematic because the neighbor discovery entries time out very rapidly and we didn't want to actually raise these entries and so we would be open to the neighbor discovery exhaustion attacks. So we implemented the neighbor discovery logging. So we actually pick up any of the, well, we, when we did that, we obviously thought, that, okay, it's a good idea to actually uh, include the V4 as well. So we pick up any ARP and neighbor discovery requests and we actually listen to the Linux kernel uh, neighbor netlink messages. We pick up the information from there and we basically keep a rolling buffer of 255 entries. So we actually know last 255 ARP and neighbor discovery entries. So we have like IP address and we have MAC address. And then we can use, use the switch MAC address table because like the CP has four Ethernet LAN ports and there's actually a chip inside there which is a five port switch and we can get MAC address table from there. So with that way we can basically show for help desk information about that, okay, the first port has PC, PC has this V4 address, PC has, has had these V6 addresses. So all your privacy addresses and whatsoever and link local will just nicely show up in there. I don't know because we don't really, we, uh, hey, actually, yeah, uh, they have used it because I have a couple of friends who are playing with it. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the same, same thing with this uh, neighbor discovery logging is that uh, we do not actively extract this information from CP. So we don't like constantly uh, pull this information. We don't want to have that information, but we only pull this information when there's a customer call and the help desk uh, opens the support information system and then the information gets pulled. 
the same way we don't want to pull like the firewall information and so on. So there might be like, but there are no, but there might be some other people who say that there are like, privacy issues and whatsoever. Go ahead. Yes, at the moment we allow only our CPs. I will come to that uh, in a second. Uh, question that many have asked is that can you do separate V6 PNG? So we have like separate boxes. I don't want to upgrade my old PNG. Can I do separate? Yes, you can do that. Uh, you obviously cannot share your V6 and V6 shapers, but uh, because you obviously would want to share your radius database, you can still do this kind of V6 to V4 uh, pinning uh, in your radius even if you have different PNGs. Uh, you have to carry around the mapping so you know that this PNG, this interface on the V4 PNG is the same Ethernet segment as this interface on the V6 PNG. You have to have this kind of mapping table, but if you have it, then you can do it. Um, and you obviously have to protect two sets of PNG MAC addresses. Um, and the PNG itself uh, is, again, as I said, controversial thing. That Many people say that, no, this kind of centralized PNG shouldn't be done all the IP routing should be distributed to the edge and the edge device should be layered through layer three router and so on and so on. So there are many flavors how you can engineer a network. Uh, so BNG is not for everyone. So that, so that way I wouldn't recommend mixing this kind of typical V4 routing and then just try to carry your V6 packet some way to the BNG. You just, when that's totally messy, just don't do that. Uh, now the four weeks part. Uh, that's being asked quite frequently. Uh, how did we do that in four weeks? Um, well, actually, we did it because we cheated. Uh, and uh, we actually deployed all the V6 configuration to the BNG uh, when we changed the BNGs over six months. Uh, then we obviously fixed the multicast issue at Access Network gradually over the time. Well, not gradually. During one day with lots of scripts. Uh, but we introduced a Ethernet, a Ethernet, Ethernet, Ethernet type based filter at the BNG. So basically, we filtered out all traffic with IPv6 ether type. So no IPv6 traffic could pass while the actual configuration was there at PNG. Then we fixed, uh, we basically waited for like another six months to get all the CP box fixed, uh, which there were many. And when this was all finally done, then we basically replaced the filter. And um, when we go back here, that's basically totally visible that uh, I removed filter from some of the interfaces here and then here and then I thought, okay, let's do some more, then I removed here and then I removed here and here and here. So that's actually just only removing the filter and everything started working magically. So we didn't do any real configuration changes there. And obviously we had to monitor that one carefully. Uh, so we used uh, NetFlow version 10 and IPFix for that. We used some mirroring from the access devices as well just to see what's happening. And the interesting part is that uh, over the last, um, what is it now, six months, uh, we have had exactly zero customer facing problems. So zero customers have called us and said that they have a problem with their internet connectivity, blah, 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 something will not work, and we have actually pinned it down to the IPv6. So we have had zero problems. I would say that the happy eyeballs probably takes care about most of the problems because most of the IPv6 content is HTTP anyway nowadays. So I will encourage everyone to do that because we have enabled quite a lot of V6 customers and we actually, actually, I promise you, we have had zero problems. We have had a lot of CP problems and stuff like that. We have figured out uh, previous in the lab. We have had some CP problems in production, but that would just mean that like V6 prefix information is not propagated to the customers and there will just not be any V6 at the land and so on. But regarding the actual problems, none. So what we plan to do, uh, we plan to support other CPs. So nowadays we only allow certain CPs, basically we filter on based on MAC address. And the reason for that is that uh, customers have crap load of different CPs and they have, well, interesting configurations. So some CPs send us uh, 100 uh, DHCPv6 messages per second, for example. So, and because you cannot really control the CP, uh, the router advertisement pits the other configuration available and managed configuration available. Don't really tell the customer CP, should it do uh, IAPD, or the prefix delegation, or should it do network address, or should it do both of them? So it doesn't really tell them. So there are CPs that actually get prefix delegation, but still hammer out the SCP service fit network address requests. And 
this is again something that's being debated at the IETF, so how should we resolve this? There is no reasonable solution at this point. So just to, basically, because the customer experience is a number one priority, priority for us, so we don't want to break the internet connectivity for these customers by injecting some IPv6 configuration that will blow up their like, local area network and so on. But that's our reasoning. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, because I mean they are from that MAC range. So we plan to fix this, but there are certain operational problems around that. So we're closely, well, basically we're closely monitoring the situation, and I plan to do some work in second half of this year, some extensive work, to figure out which are the like, most used CPs and, and what should we do about them. Obviously, we want to support the static uh, V6 prefix. So that's something that gets sent from the radio, so this will not be sent to the V60 server at all. So this information will come from radio, so that's just purely our own internal IP development stuff. We want to support static IPv6 routes in the LAN, so because, and for that we need address hints. So that's not there yet, because the customer V6 prefix can change, and I want to create a static route that says that I want to route, let's say, sixth of the slash 64 store with some link local address in the LAN, you cannot do that today because you, can, you only can hard code the V6 address, but you would want to use address hint that says that you must use the sixth V slash 64 from whichever prefix you get allocated. We would love to do hierarchical prefix delegation so the customer can actually attach the second router between this uh, first router, behind this first router, and g again get uh, a slash 64 delegated to that router automatically. So that's something that's not there today yet. Uh, we would want to push uh, our voice over IP and IPTV to V6. So we would have our internal content as well. And we actually are starting now some work on our mobile network. Uh, and actually, I'm happy to say that our voice over LTE, uh, let's say product, or not the really product, but the, the voice over LTE that would enable us to carry voice as an IP traffic over our LTE network, uh, this is not uh, launched yet. Uh, it's not a secret, but it's not launched yet, but it's uh, native IPv6 only. So there is no V4 involved in any way. So that we have engineered as a V6 only. So the, all the session border gateways at the head end, all the, basically your endpoint, your APN endpoint at your mobile phone, it's all native V6 and nothing else. And it actually does work. And it works really, really well. Roaming is problematic. Roaming is seriously problematic. Uh, because uh, when you set up the roaming sessions over the GRX, uh, you can initiate, or basically send to the, the visit, uh, visited network, you can set this information that the PDP context should be like V4 only, V6 only, or mixed V4, V6. But the mixed V4, V6 and the V6 were introduced in the uh, not latest, but let's say in the last three years. Uh, so the GPP release that, was, that came out three years ago, this is only the release where this was implemented. And if the visited network somewhere in Uganda, for example, I'm sorry if there are any people from Uganda here, uh, in Uganda uh, runs at the older GPP release, which is totally typical and it is okay. So they will not understand this PDP context setup message and you will have roaming problems. So for that, I think that we will see that the roaming will remain for IPv4 only for who knows how long time. I think that you couldn't at this point. <laughs> at this point, you couldn't. And uh, some stats. So uh, we have, well, they didn't mention it at start, but we have 250,000 subscribers in our network. Well, a little bit more. Uh, now, I checked this morning that we have a little bit over 38,000 V6 enabled subscribers. And two important numbers is that 81% of these uh, 38,000 subscribers actually have a V6 capable device that's, that uses V6 in their land. So the, then again, the 81 might sound as a low number. So because, why, which devices are there? But uh, because we have customers that only use uh, our IPT product, for example, or only use our voice or IP. But from IPv6 perspective, we don't care. We just roll out IPv6 for all the of these CPs. 
So it's quite realistic that we have quite a number of uh, customers who just only have a whole setup box, for example. And the whole setup box at this point doesn't support V6. And actually, 70% of these uh, subscribers have more than one IPv6 enabled device. And because we have chosen router advertisement and, and uh, basically two flavors how to inject the DNS information, uh, and the technically you don't actually need a V6 DNS. So we basically, the LAN configuration is compatible with almost any device that's out there. So all the recent Windows machines, Linux machines, macOS machines, Android phones, iOS phones, tablets, whatever. So they all support V6. And content-wise, uh, we have a local uh, web hosting shop that actually is also quite innovative, and they now turned on V6 for most of the web hosts there. So they support uh, basically on the local market V6. Obviously, we see uh, quite a lot of Google, YouTube, and Google Analytics traffic. So Google Analytics is also important because it makes you easier to track, uh, because they actually can see your V6 address and so on. So please turn on the privacy addresses at your computer or use some browser plugins that will block the Google Analytics. That's what I do. Um, obviously, all the CDNs, all the major CDNs, they support V6, and we see traffic on V6. We see traffic on Facebook, obviously. Uh, there are some Russian website, basically Russian, uh, Russian Facebook and some Russian uh, search, in, search engine that's also getting used via the V6. And we see torrent over V6, towards some other European operators, and we see a this kind of gaming VPN product called Hamachi, which that is used to set up a like layer two network over internet to play old legacy games or do whatever you want to do. So that also supports V6, so we also see that as well. And that's all from me. So. <laughs> so any question? Any questions, ask now, because uh, I will basically immediately leave after this talk to catch my now reassigned plane. <coughs> so that was supposed to be last uh, tomorrow morning, but it's Please tonight. Please send me those slides, Asa. Yeah, I, will, I, so can, I can, I can uh, like you did, Mary, uh, like take pictures of certain slides. Uh, So any questions, any explanations required? So that's quite controversial because it doesn't really match up your typical campus data center networks in any way. It is exactly what I had hoped for, so. Excellent. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks again.